Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this bright, sunny afternoon. Um, if it isn't weather-wise where you are, we're bringing the sunshine today with our featured book and our two authors. Uh, please remember that you are watching this on a YouTube channel and it helps us a lot. If you will like and subscribe to the uh, Book Passage YouTube channel, it only takes you a second, but it really means a lot to us. Also keep in mind, we'd love you to actively participate in today's event by um, putting your comments and your questions in the chat. I promise we will get to them um, probably closer to the end of the event. Um, but really, we do encourage your comments and your questions. Um, today's featured book, I Am a Girl from Africa, is a searing and utterly inspiring memoir. After meeting a UN aid worker who basically saved her life after drought, a drought hit her village in Zimbabwe, uh, Elizabeth Yamayero was determined to work to help others. From then on, Elizabeth dedicated herself to giving back to her community, her continent, and the world. In the decades that have followed, Elizabeth has been instrumental in creating change and uplifting the lives of others by fighting global inequalities, advancing social justice for vulnerable communities. And she obviously will be talking more about this, um, but it's all chronicled in her book, I Am a Girl from Africa, which I love. It's already, it was one of, listed as one of my favorite memoirs from last year, and now it is available in paperback. Joining Elizabeth to talk about this extraordinary journey is Faith Adela, and she is an award-winning author. She has a memoir or two of her own, uh, including Meeting Faith, also one of my very favorites that we do have plenty of at Book Passage. She is a travel and food writer, social justice and speech, uh, spiritual, talks about spiritual narratives. Um, she is a writer. A World of Calm, uh, HBO Max, Calm Sleep Stories. Uh, her, her book, her memoir, Meeting Faith, recounts her journey to Thailand as the country's first Black Buddhist nun. Both these women are extraordinary, adding so much to the world, and we're so lucky to have them today uh, on the virtual book passage stage. With that, I am going to pass it on to Faith. Thank you so much, Paula. <clears throat> Welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for being here, Elizabeth. It's really exciting to meet you. This book has gotten ringing endorsements from everybody, from Oprah to Dave Eggers to your mentor, Dr. Pumzile. Um, I watched you on Trevor Noah. I've listened to your TED Talk. And so I'm just so honored that you would spend this time with us. Um, and I also want to thank Paula for inviting me to be part of this. Uh, Book Passage is one of the best curated books and has an incredible lineup of writers happening all the time. So it just feels like it was a no brainer when she said, do I want to talk to you at Book Passage? The answer, of course, was yes. <laughs> so welcome virtually to San Francisco. And um, I'd love it if you could start with just reading a little bit from the book uh, to give us a taste. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much, Faith and Paula, for this incredible opportunity. I'm going to start, actually, I'm going to read two paragraphs, and it's the opening of the book, page one, where it all begins. Stand. I tell myself, but I cannot. I lie on my stomach, my legs stretched out my arms limp at my sides, my palms tense towards the heavens, begging for mercy. I burrow my fist deeper into the ground, seeking shelter from the scorching sun, yet the earth feels as hot as fire, practically sizzling beneath me. There is no cool or comfortable place to hide. The leaves of the trees are long gone and with it the shade bent away by the punishing drought that is descended on our small village in Zimbabwe. Rise, I think, but I cannot. I'm simply too weak to move. I am starving. 
I've had nothing to eat or drink for three days. My shrinking stomach growls like two hungry hyenas fighting over a goat. I'm so thirsty. It's as if tiny sharp razors slice the inside of my throat with each breath or attempt to swallow. I have never felt so hollow and wasted from hunger. I worry that the drought may never end and I will never leave this tree. I would die here, I think, but I'm too tired to be truly frightened. Mm. And mm. Mm. thank you, thank you. <laughs> driving us right into the middle of things and this is such a key moment that really launches a lifelong quest that takes you you know takes you to the west takes you back to Africa um, you know takes you through so many different people's lives it's really fascinating there's so many journeys happening here um, maybe we should just summarize the book for those of us who haven't read it yet <clears throat> If you want to say what you think it is, and I'll tell you what I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds really good. Now, I really wanted to start here because this is such a pivotal moment in my life. And it's also a moment that, you know, obviously not to the same extent, but I think often we've found ourselves just going through these really, really hardship moments. Mm -hmm. And we often feel in those moments that this is going to break us, right? That things cannot get any worse than they are. And it can also make us feel very demoralized and demotivated. And I just wanted to read this as a reminder that, you know, as you can see, I am perfectly fine now <laughs> that sometimes some of our greatest challenges also give us our greatest opportunities. And this is actually what this book is all about. This is a book about a journey that begins in a small village in Zimbabwe where I was raised by my gogo, my grandmother, in fact, inside this very same house behind me. Mm. This was my home. Oh, and, wow. and, and it starts with this pivotal moment where I am going through a very, very challenging time. And the reason why it becomes more dire for us is because this was not our reality. You know, I grew up in this beautiful small village. Mm. We took care of each other. We are such a sense of community. We grew all our crops together and we shared all our food. And I remember as a child never wanting for anything mm. because there was such an abundance of food. But again, because of drought, which had nothing to do with us, right? right. Our lives got turned upside down. And in this moment, I think I am going to die because there's nothing left in our village. But it also becomes a pivotal moment that really you know, defines the course of my entire life. So it's that journey from that small village mm -hmm. really leading to the work that I've done now with the United Nations. Uh, and of course, the, the hardships along the way, you know, this is a story about daring to dream big, bigger mm. than your current circumstances and chasing that dream against all odds. And here we are. Mm. I love that daring to dream big. Um, and yeah, dreaming and faith and all of these things are so important in this story. Um, and I really saw it as like a typical hero's journey, you know, where you're like, you embark on this quest, you're like looking for your mentor, you're looking for your mission, you go through these hardships, and these things that could challenge your faith and your resolve. Yeah, including like going to the wrong country, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which I love. <laughs> and then, you know, and then kind of returning to, you know, returning home. And so I love, it's got all that kind of classical great stuff of literature that we expect in the hero's journey. Um, it's also a coming of age memoir, you know, in which we see the young Elizabeth, you know, stepping into her power and moving yeah. from that, who am I? I'm daring to dream too big to I can dream this and I can do this. And I keep hearing no, and I'm going to turn that into yes. We have that lovely coming of age memoir. And I also, I always see um, travel memoir and travel stories as spiritual stories too, as a kind of a spiritual narrative. And so I feel like all of the things are, all of these things are happening together. Um, I'm also really struck by, it's a bit of a love letter to your go, go. I mean, right. Yes. She's the one who taught you how, what it is to be African truly. Mm -hmm. um, and there's so much kind of love and respect for her in this story too. Um, so there are just a lot of really interesting things that are happening here. 
uh, that I want to let people know that you're going to be getting, you know, a development primer, you're going to be getting a travel tale, you're going to get all sorts of things in, in one woman's story, um, which I think those are the best memoirs. It's not just an individual, but you're letting us know about an entire culture and community as well. So Faith, first of all, that is the best submission I've ever heard. I want it recorded somewhere and I just want to like use that for everyone who wants to know about the book. So thank you. But but indeed, I think it is also a story about community. You know, I recognized when I was given this opportunity to write the memoir that I needed to use this as a way to not only tell my story, but also tell the story of my incredible community, right? Starting with my own African family who have uplifted me, who have nurtured me, who have, you know, raised me into the woman that I am today. Mm. But also it's a love letter to our beautiful African continent because yeah. we don't celebrate it enough. And yeah. I saw the opportunity as well as an African to be part of telling this full narrative of the African continent and not this sort of single narrative of poverty and looking at Africa as a country, not really understanding the diversity of our continent. Uh, and so that also became really such an incredible, you know, platform for me to be able to share different aspects and use the proverbs to take the reader mm. on this beautiful African journey. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, wow, that brings up a, a number of things I want to talk about. Um, and I'm going to, and I'm just going to launch into the idea of, of the term Africa, because you did yeah. mention that Africa is not a country. Um, and so I was really interested in the use of the term Africa, the title, you know, a girl yeah. from Africa, but then also we begin deep in the African wilderness. And this is a moment right now where we're seeing such a flourishing of Africa on the on the global stage with you know particularly around arts and design and music and all of a sudden it's cool to be African and people are seeing all the incredible things we've been doing and maybe for the first time Westerners know that Africa isn't a country and they're actual nation states with names um, and I know you've been active in kind of you know approaching uh, you know, the marketing of Africa and trying to provide a kind of a holistic African point of view and development. So I'm really interested in your in your decision to use Africa, this term, and what are you signifying here for us? Yes. So this was a key decision that I had to make earlier on, right? Because I am born in Zimbabwe. So the book could have easily been called I'm a girl from Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. But my very understanding of my own identity happened when I was five years old and my gogo, my grandmother who raised me, taught me that what it means to be an African. And she said, before you are Zimbabwean or Nigerian or anything else, you are first and foremost a child of the African soil. In mm. my language, you are Mwana Wevo, which is such a powerful thing. You know, this idea that we are all connected to each other, just like the single grain of sand, right? And there's just so much power in that. So. I knew that there was something really beautiful and a true blessing to call myself an African. So I first and foremost wanted to honor that. Yes. But then I also as a thought leader, you know, who is constantly frustrated when you <laughs> sit around people in the West and they consider Africa as a country. I also <laughs> thought, you know what, perhaps there could be a really nice provocative way of starting mm. the conversation. So I purposely named the book, I'm a girl from Africa, first, first and foremost, to claim my African heritage and celebrate that because I also found when I left the African continent that people started looking down upon me, especially mm -hmm. when I was in the UK because of who I am. And I was like, mm -hmm. no, being an African is the coolest thing ever. I am a girl from Africa. It's the proclamation of my heritage. But I also wanted to have the conversation, you know, have the book start a conversation by yeah. being sort of provocative about it. A girl from Africa, what does that mean? And I think that's the conversation we're having today. And mm. what it means is it is a celebration of this beautiful continent of 1.2 billion people, 55 countries speaking 2000 languages. Mm. And I tried as much as possible in the narrative as well. Proverb is one way that I bring kind of the yeah. cultural diversity this use of really beautiful African symbols from different parts of the continent. So that is the conversation that we need to have. Wonderful. That's great. That's great. And I, yeah, I love the idea of also being the provocateur to get people talking. Um, 
in I have a documentary documentary about finding my family in Nigeria. And the first line is, though I'm African and though I'm American, I'm not African American. Because of course, that's what people assume when they see me here. Yeah. So the world gets all hot and bothered. And then you can start to have the conversation. So you do need to hook people with that kind of provocativeness. Um, <clears throat> and I love how you're talking about the importance of the collective and also of the oral tradition throughout the continent, which is something that unites us. And this book really has that. Um, I mean, one, I was just thinking of the whole, the idea of Latin America, of the testimonial where one person tells their story and it symbolizes the entire community. And that that's really kind of important uh, civic work and community building of just kind of putting your story out there. And it, and it, you know, to me, I thought the oral tradition was so alive here. Um, and these, you know, these lessons that you're always learning about how to be African in the world and how to kind of carry that with pride. Yeah, but um, also I'm in faith also on that. I think that was another, you know, choice of using this title was to be able to use that as a way to inspire more African voices, more girls from the African continent to tell their story mm -hmm. and recognize just how worthy they are. The book is not, I am the girl from Africa. I just <laughs> a girl, you know, my story is one of millions. And hopefully by starting this conversation, we can inspire more girls from our continent to be able to, you know, tell the story with the African lens and, and just we are beautiful storytellers and we need right. more stories from the continent. Exactly. Yes. Avoid that danger of the single story and really encourage as many stories as possible. <coughs> well, I love the structure of the book. I'm a memoirist and I'm just obsessed with structure in particular. How do you um, how do you like perform multiple points of views and how do you decolonize the structure we've inherited? And so I really was fascinated by the structure you've used. And for people who haven't read the book yet, um, I'll just say that there are 17 short chapters, each which begins with an African proverb, which just immediately puts kind of the oral perspective there, which is fantastic. And then we've got kind of the chronological journey of beginning with your arrival in Europe in 2000, um, and then kind of seminal moments in your career as you travel and meet people and start initiatives. But interwoven with that in every chapter are these flashbacks to your childhood in Zimbabwe, which are in the child's point of view and the child's voice. And you've got Shauna words in there and you have all these great you know, like idioms like plenty, plenty and smart, smart. And I was like, I recognize that. I hear that. <laughs> um, and then there's also a, a journey that the young Elizabeth goes to from, you know, being in the village with your go-go to like moving to town with your uh, parents and your auntie and uncle to go to school. Um, so there are all these really interesting things happen. And then the book itself has this great appendix at the end, which tells you how to, how to take action around all of these issues. So it's a really fascinating intentional structure. And I was hoping you could talk about how you came up with it. Yes, so the first thing that I did was just literally write the book in chronological order, right? And then when I was done with that, as I was looking and reviewing the book, I realized that this was not the best way to tell the story, at least my mm. story. Mm. And it was key because often, right, sometimes people who come from underprivileged communities such as mine, your biggest dream is to try and escape from where you come from, right? You work so hard so you can end up at Harvard and then you never look back, right? Because that was the past and now you're this new improved person. And for me, it was a complete opposite understanding of who I am. And I realized that doing the book in chronological order, it kind of took me away from my roots. Right. I think yeah. one of the proverbs they, you know, from from Sudan talks about, you know, how we really bequeath our children to things, roots and wings. Right. And so my roots is very, very African. My entire family lives on the African continent. I'm the only one who left the, the African continent. And by then weaving. So I decided, you know what, I was going to actually do this weaving of the narratives, the young braid, which is the young Elizabeth and the old braid, which is like the mature me. Mm. And part of the reason for that is that every time I wanted you to understand if I'm making a decision, right? So I do great work at the UN. I wanted you to understand that these initiatives or this way of thinking or this way of looking at the world was grounded in my mm. African heritage. Mm. So you're constantly being taken back to, 
oh, this is how mm. Africa is informing the way that she's making a decision, how Africa is informing this big UN initiative called T for She. So that was really, really important to me to be able to mm. always remind the viewer of who I am, because that's the thing I think I've also realized, you know, having lived in around the world like you have faith that being African is the greatest thing. The thing that I'm most proud of is, is my African heritage. So I wanted that to be just prominent across the entire storyline. Mm. And it also enabled me to take a piece of Africa with me constantly. Mm. Uh -huh. You know, it's why I wear yellow. Yellow was the beautiful African sky that I woke up to every single morning. So when I wear yellow, it allows me to take a piece of Africa with me. So the weaving really became a, such an important, important piece of telling that story so that the viewer got to understand the why. Why is she yes. doing this? Why does she think yes. this way? And it all comes down to the beach for African cultures and the values. Mm, I love that. Yeah, and it, it challenges the, I think the Western narrative, which is, you know, just progress and always forward and like leaving those so-called <laughs> lowly roots. And so I love, yeah. yeah, every kind of, oh, kind of turning point or transition or decision. Then, and then we were back in, in Zimbabwe and realizing that those, you know, the go-go knew what, she knew it all, right? Every little <laughs> lesson did. was so useful and it was really great. Um, yeah, it, it becomes such an education. I mean, it, it reminds me of the way we do learn, you know, our, our grandparents to, you know, tell us these proverbs that don't make any sense or to us or make us go and do this thing. And it's very experiential based. And it's very rooted in like longstanding history and stories. You know, you have to hear the whole story to kind of know what to do. And so I really appreciated that, you know, while I'm like meeting all of these famous people that you're interacting with and seeing these big initiatives that we're always still going back to why are we doing this? Who is yeah. it for? You know, yeah. um, which I thought was really fascinating. Really, and yeah, very, very helpful. Um, I want you to talk just a little bit about showing up in London thinking that you're gonna work at the UN and, and <laughs> discovering you've gone to the wrong country. <laughs> So, <laughs> uh, I know I mean you you can't write this stuff but yet we have written this stuff right so so this pivotal moment happens to me at the age of eight when I'm almost starving to death and mm -hmm. in fact what's also very very interesting something that I constantly like to emphasize is that the humanitarian who found me was a fellow African right because you often think about the UN aid worker and automatically you think it's some kind of white savior narrative and this wasn't this. It was just another fellow African who was a humanitarian who decided to give back and save my life. And I just remember thinking what a powerful thing, right? To be able to do something that is so meaningful. And I decided I just wanted to be like the girl in the blue uniform. I too had to figure out a way to make a difference in the world and hopefully save someone's life, right? in a similar way that my life had been saved. And so in my 20s, I decided that going to London was going to be part of that journey of achieving my dream. So of course, it's a very complicated thing. I try and raise money. My wonderful Gogo -go ends up selling a livestock just to buy me a ticket to go to London. I managed to get a ticket. I landed Heathrow Airport one sunny afternoon, like actually early morning, and I have 250 pounds to my name. I don't know anyone in the UK, but it doesn't matter, right? Because God has led me there. My faith has led me there. And I've done my research in the library too, by the way, because I was such a good student, was pre-internet. <laughs> I found that there was this incredible UN office in London, and I was going to try and look for a job. Of course, immediately I landed in London. The next morning, I go to this UN office, and turns out it actually was in the United Nations. <laughs> It was an organization called the United Nations Association, hence the confusion, which I thought was like any other UN entity like UNICEF, right, or UNAIDS or WHO. And this wasn't the case. This is a small independent organization set up to promote the work of the UN, but it is not the UN. And immediately my dream just like falls apart. And I realized I'm in the wrong country. I don't have any money to go to Geneva or New York, which is where the UN is located. 
Uh, at some point, I actually run out of money. I almost become homeless. It's a whole drama, right? But my faith kept me going. And eventually, an incredible miracle happened, which you can read about in the book. Yes, yes. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yes. Uh, so many times, you know, it, it really, I mean, the stakes are so high. And then every time, like faith um, just it sees you through. And the mission, you were meant to do this, you know, and I, I just love that. Um, <clears throat> someone in the chat has asked about what I meant about travel stories as spiritual stories. And this is really it, right? You're like, you know, you're, you're home and you know, and you know, your home and you feel safe there. And then often with both with spiritual narratives, there's some sort of crisis of faith that happens, um, you know, a physical one or a psychological one. And then you kind of wander out into the wilderness and, you know, through the dark night of the soul and encounter things, you know, that you have to overcome. They could be external like monsters. They could be internal, <laughs> which is really heavy, you know, um, and you really have to risk something. And then you kind of return transformed through, you know, through the journey. And so I, I see so much of the travel stories that interest me most ha have this kind of spiritual underpinning where there's something really big at stake, you know? Yeah. And the internal monsters were really, really tough for me because just the amount of insecurity that I ended up having to face when I was in the UK, yes, just this fish out of water moment, right? Everything, I never left the African continent. Everything mm -hmm. looked and felt different, the culture, the people. But most importantly, also just the way that I was being perceived as an African right. and people saw me as less than, saw me as inferior. And I started doubting everything that I knew to be true about myself. I just thought maybe I'm not meant to be here. Maybe this is just too much of a big dream. Like I'm just a small girl from a small village. What business do I think that I can actually work for the United Nations? But again, back to what you said about faith and also having an understanding of your why, right? This dream for me was bigger than myself, right? And one of the things that my Gogo taught me when I was young was also, you know, there's this beautiful ancient African wisdom called Ubuntu. Yes. And it literally means I am because we are, right? And it recognizes this interconnectedness that, you know, a person is a person through other people that we're all connected by our shared humanity and because of that there's lots of responsibilities and beauty that comes out you know the fact that you are you are part of a community you're part of a greater whole so if you need someone someone would be there to uplift you and it's kind of how we took care of each other in my village it was part right. of this ubuntu understanding but a really really fascinating thing as well that my gogo taught me was what it meant to dream, you know, through this Ubuntu lens and this understanding that you can dream a dream for others, right? Mm -hmm. That your dream, sure, you can dream a dream for yourself, but mm -hmm. it can also be for others, meaning that looking for a dream that can also uplift the lives of others. And, and certainly being a humanitarian was driven by this key moment with a girl in the blue uniform, but it was also this Ubuntu understanding that because my life was being uplifted in so many ways right. that I also had a responsibility to try and uplift the lives of others. And so when things were really, really tough, I can tell you and guarantee you that if this was just a dream for myself to become, I don't know, an engineer or something else, I would have given up. I would have just thought this okay. is too much, but I knew there was so much at stake because my dream was also a dream for my community. Mm -hmm. And I just, couldn't let them down. I like mm. I, I I needed to get that done. Yes, yes. That's so the that, that's so true. When you have a, you know, bigger mission or it's bigger than yourself, you can kind yeah. of you're kind of amazed at what you can do. You know, it comes through you almost. So I think that is so important. And we can lose sight of that because the West is so based on the individual and individual happiness at every moment and accomplishment and not thinking about these things that could actually psychologically actually better for us, you know, living for the community. Um, you know, and then, we, and, but then there's this kind of wonderful story where you arrive with like, no money and a dream that fizzles. And then, you know, a few years later, you're, you know, graduating from London School of Economics, you know, you're working at the UN. I mean, you're doing all of these things, uh, which are really fantastic. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, your advocacy work and, and what are some of, uh, 
you know, you've talked about Ubuntu, but other African-based models that could help organizations do better? Because I see there's a real, as you mentioned, you know, on the continent, we do things through kinship ties and clan ties and vi village ties. We know people. And then these organizations come in and they're based on institutions and not necessarily knowing people or even working with people on the ground. <laughs> so kind of <laughs> what can you advise us? <laughs> what have you learned about bringing the African based model into this work on a global scale? So first of all, that there can be no development without the community. You know, there's a saying from communities that what's done for us without us is not for us. And this is so spot on. And yet we constantly try and do things without engaging the communities. And as we can see, even just now with the with the current pandemic and having top down policies on vaccines or you know, all these response efforts, they just never work unless we actually engage the communities and also take the time to understand and appreciate their culture and the way that they do things. It can appear very slow in the beginning, building right. that consensus, but ultimately real sustainable change happens when the community buy into the idea, when they're leading and informing that change. And so even with this book, my other key audience that I just wanted to make sure I, I stood right by them was the communities that I engage as part of my humanitarian work mm -hmm. and changing that narrative, right? Because often there's very little dignity given to people who are in need. You know, we see right. them as helpless. We see them as lazy even sometimes. And we see ourselves as the saviors going in like to save them, right? From okay. whatever situation may be. And that's actually not true. You know, time and time again, I've been on the ground mm -hmm. and I have seen that actually the communities are their own heroes. They are the protagonists of their own stories mm -hmm. and their own narrative. And a lot of the stories that I decided to share, because I mean, I have millions of stories that I could have shared, but right. I really chose the ones where I was able to demonstrate in an authentic way, look at what this community did for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that was really, really important for me to be able to acknowledge that and for people to see that because often in the humanitarian space, we are constantly undermining communities. Yes. We are constantly creating solutions outside of them and coming in and imposing what needs to be done. And so for me, if I have to make one simple call in terms of advocacy and how we need to rethink We've got to rethink our approach to how we support communities in need. They have to lead and inform change. They have to be our equal partners in designing and implementing and monitoring those pro uh, projects. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful, great, thank you. And I saw that you did that in a different way if you think about the community of men. So yeah. with, uh, you know, <laughs> so much of your work is focused on the girl child and also the kind of global problem, not just African problem of child marriage. Yeah. Um, and one of the you know important things you've done is inviting men to be part of that solution. And I'm really fascinated by that because so often we get that, well, it's our tradition argument that does not allow us to do things or you're just an outsider. And so can you talk a bit about how you've been able to be so successful around that? So that was a really, really important initiative that just, I think whose time had come you know, when I was in 2014, I had this incredible honor as part of my work at UN Women as a senior advisor there to really think about how we could accelerate progress towards gender equality and really explore other new ways of looking at the problem. Because for a very long time, the issue of gender inequality has been seen as a, you know, an issue for women led by women for women. Mm -hmm. And I also, as a feminist, I appreciate that because also we're not going to wait for someone else to like give us a permission yeah. to be and to exist and to be equal partners in, in this world. But I also saw another really interesting opportunity, which was this way of doing things. It's really great because it empowers us. You know, we are not seeking permission from anyone, but at the same time, it also means that we are constantly having to do all the work, right? And so I saw an opportunity to say, if men are the people that are causing all these inequalities, if men are the ones raping women, if mm. they are the ones marrying underage girls, if they are the ones creating you know, unequal work, workplace policies, they shouldn't they be the ones also doing the work? 
So we blame a woman for getting raped. Shouldn't we? Mm. Shouldn't the man just not rape a woman? <laughs> and so this was a really, really important, um, I think, platform that needed to be created where we could invite men to be part of the conversation, but also be part of the solution, use their privilege to dismantle all these inequalities that we constantly face as women and girls. And again, this led to the creation of this incredible movement called the He For She movement, which mm -hmm. is really built on this African philosophy of Ubuntu, this allyship, the need for allyship that we've got to have the people with the most power doing as much work, if not more work than the people that are being oppressed. And you and I, we can say the same thing about race, mm -hmm. you know, Right. We are the ones constantly marching for equality. We need right. the people on the other side to do the work. They are the ones doing the oppressing. And so they also have to be able to do the work. And so this was really an important, I think, understanding of what needs to change. How do we use the current power dynamics to actually accelerate progress? Because yes, we can do it ourselves. We can break the glass ceiling, but it's great if we don't have to cut our hands breaking the glass ceiling. So <laughs> men can just remove it, right? Men can just remove it because they put it there to begin with. Um, and so, so that's 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 my approach to doing things that I think really figuring out to create allyship and solidarity and working together as a collective to end really any of the pressing inequalities require that we work together. And I think the pandemic is showing us exactly the same lesson. It's a group project. We've got to work mm -hmm. together. Otherwise, we will never succeed. Right, right, right. Yeah. Huh. Um, I mean, I, I appreciate the fact that you also then made the connection to the work of dismantling white supremacy and the white supremacist system in, in the U.S. because, you know, so much of it is put on, on people of color and Black folks, and it's so exhausting. Um, and, I'm, and I'm also seeing um, at a certain point white folks just have kind of fatigue around these issues. They're, they're tired of feeling like bad guys. And if it seems like if you even talk about race, they see that as an attack um, yeah. because they're used to, you know, not having to talk about it. <laughs> um, and so I'm wondering if you've kind of faced that as well with men not wanting to own their privilege. No one wants to own their privilege, really. They want to have the privilege, but they don't want to admit that they have the privilege. And so tired, uh, they feel as though they've been attacked or what are kind of ways that you've you've been able to enlist men in this idea yeah but i mean also faith on this issue of of white folks getting tired my god you get tired i, know, <laughs> I right? mean do we even begin to understand the word of the word tired i think I black folks are tired like we are totally are so tired and so i think first and foremost i think if anyone is feeling tired I would say perhaps reevaluate what you mean by the word tired because you haven't even begun to do the work. I and know. if you are feeling tired, then perhaps this look at this as an invitation to actually do something, right? And not feel fatigued by something that just simply is not going to go away, not unless we all work together uh, as a collective. So yes, on the he for she front, there were some men who didn't care, but, but here's the thing that I constantly come back to faith, which is that there are a lot more good people, mm. you know, not using qualifiers for people, but there, there are people out there that want to do the right thing that are equally right. fatigued. Like I know lots of white folks that are equally fatigued mm -hmm. with living in a world where people are being discriminated against simply because of their race that want to do the right thing, but they simply somehow don't know where to begin because it's a, you know, it's, it's, it's touchy because yeah you know, we are angst about it. And so we are so angst about it because we're sick and tired of being oppressed. And so right. it, it can also make people feel very insecure about where to begin. They don't want to say mm -hmm. the wrong thing. And this was actually what was really remarkable and telling for he for she that a lot of the men out there actually said, you know, we've wanted to engage with this. Mm -hmm. And we had we have the data, right, to prove that mm -hmm. this actually was real. When we launched he for she within five days, there was at least one man in every single country in the world who joined the movement. Wow. There was 1.2 billion online conversations in just one week. So that tells you that there was this sort of silent majority that wanted to do the right thing, but just didn't know what to do. And so yeah. I think we also have, I think the ownership happens in both direction. As black folks, when we talk about race, we also have to, and I know it's painful, <laughs> but we also <laughs> have to be able to create the platform where people can learn they can also make mistakes 
Yes. And as long as the intent is right, and we can right. tell, anyone can tell if the intent is right. You yes. know, I think by just creating that platform really enabled us. And what was also remarkable is that we saw that by having a critical mass, you know, sort of say, raise their hands and say, I want to do the right thing for gender equality. It also gave permission for the men that were kind of sitting on the fence, on the sidelines, mm. not wanting to be emasculated for being, you know, standing up for gender equality to step in. And I think we need a similar sort of understanding around race that the silent majority that are out there that want to do the right things, please join us in raising awareness of this issue, not in front of us, but even with people, she was like in solidarity alongside, right. yes. you know, not for you to dominate the conversation, but to work together with us, letting us lead the conversation, but being there as allies. Right, right. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> Well, I have one more question for you and I wanna invite people in the audience to start putting their questions to the chat because we'll move into that and turn it into a larger conversation. Um, but you mentioned the online conversations and I'm really interested uh, in what you found the role of social media to be in kind of moving this initiative forwards and, and uh, affecting actual change. I mean, it was critical. There is obviously, social media is very complicated <laughs> because it is also, you know, it can be used for good, which is what we're able to do with the He For She movement with my colleagues at UN Women. But we also know that there's so many problems with it, right? Yeah. And, and I think to the extent that we're able to leverage social media to use it as a platform for fueling, you know, social movements, I think it has a really, really key role that it can play without the social media I don't think we would have been able to galvanize such a, you know, such a, such a global movement. And we needed to have the global movement to kind of normalize this idea that men can and should stand up for gender equality. So I just think that, you know, it all comes down to the design that, you know, we put in our programs, but there is, there is an opportunity uh, that is, I think, not yet fully tapped into of mm. using social media for good. Mm. Um, and it's, it's get more complicated. Even right now, like I have my own like frustration and pain point. Every time when I try and post something about climate change or about social issues, and, and I try and, and promote that post, IG tells me that it's a social, it's political, we can't push it. And, and, and that, that is very, very um, you know, challenging for us because we've got to be able to use this social media platform, not just to make money, right? right. But also to be able to actually push social movements and, and, and work on social justice and, and, and human rights issues without politicizing things that are just really about uplifting all of us as one humanity. Right, right, just basic human needs. Wow, yeah. wow. that's interesting. But I love the idea of that you know, normalizing things like using social media just quickly. I think it can just like really quickly and globally Mm -hmm. normalize conversations we see that with you know yeah with these hashtags that just you know take over and things that we weren't able to speak about before that people had shame about or something just like yeah quickly can really shift uh and that is key for then making the on, on the ground change so i love that i love that approach because oftentimes you're being criticized like what does you know clicking or liking do to change the world but you know you really have to change the mindset and the language too yeah yeah to do that yeah I mean, of course, hopefully it's, it's, it goes beyond click activism, but there's right. also moments when, you know, like, I, I think we know what we are talking about here, the, the hashtags that have really been able to create real change in, you know, in the, in our world um, and, and hold people accountable for things that they'd gotten away with for so many, for so right. many decades. So, so I, I think it works both ways, but I think also for young people though, anyone listening, the key isn't just to like a post, you know, the key mm -hmm. is to right. obviously educate yourself on the issue, take action in your community. We are living in a world of rising inequalities. We are living in a world right now where the change that is needed is literally going to require all of us. You know, the pandemic set us back two decades of progress uh, on any of the developmental issues that we've been pushing for. So Mm. In any community, it's not about feeding hungry children in Africa, you know, there's hungry <laughs> children here in America, you yes. know, so you can just be part of your community and uplift someone within that, you know, within your, your own country, within your own space. 
Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Okay, let's see what the audience wants us to talk about. Um, I see something here. It says, it's one thing to achieve the big goal of working for the UN, but another to create your own nonprofit. Where did that dream come from and how was it brought forth? So I'm constantly looking to, you know, everything that has kind of formed my path and my journey starts with a why. Why am I doing this? And early on, my why, really the, the initial why was realizing that so much had been given to me. There's an African proverb, right? To whom so much is given, so much is expected. I realized that I had a little bit more than my own siblings. And so my why was really to try and work hard to make things better for them. And I tell those stories in the book as well. And then when I had accomplished that, my next why was how can I create even bigger impact? And I'm constantly searching. My husband makes a joke that I'm constantly searching for impact. So <laughs> everything that I do is like driven from this why. And mm -hmm. so I realized at some point as well, I'd been in the UN now for more than two decades. And I realized that, you know, there was an opportunity for me to be able to also really focus back on the work that was happening on the African continent. And so that was that why of making sure that as an African, I'm also playing a key role in making a difference to my continent mm -hmm. before, you know, in addition to all the work that is being done um, in the world. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what drives me. Wonderful. That's great. Lovely. Um, someone is asking about your yellow clothing and cover, which you talked about being Africa. <laughs> yeah. And I, and I, no, I'm so, yes. Yeah, so so it's also, it's also key because again, it's part of, um, you know, visual symbols are very powerful and faith, you know, all this. And I also recognize that the imagery that is often associated with my African continent, our African continent, in fact, is one of a dark continent, right? Yes. yes. And that is not that is not my reality. You know, at the age of five, I was in charge of tying my gogos goats every single morning, and I would wake up at five o'clock to this just the most beautiful and just beautiful four yellow skies that you ever seen, mm -hmm. and so. It's also part of that, you know, and, and in addition to that, you know, yellow is such an optimistic color, it's vibrant color, and that's what the African continent is. It's a vibrant continent. It's, if you wanna find people who are optimistic, you just gotta go to the African continent. And so <laughs> right? I, I also wanted that to be part of the narrative, you know, the visual narrative of, of telling this story, I'm a girl from Africa. Mm, uh, I so appreciate that. I'm actually working on an article right now for a uh, travel anthology and talking about how that that dark continent, heart of darkness stuff is just, it's insidious, it's everywhere. You see it in photo shoots, it's, you hear it on the news. I mean, it's just those, those image, that dark imagery is just, it's insane. And you're right, we have to, every opportunity, we have to be dismantling it and rejecting it because it has just lasted for so long and it's yes and it's also not true it's just right. not true but actually this is a good segue actually i'm gonna put you in the hot seat <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about the yellow glasses let's talk about the yellow wall so you're also yellow i am also yellow <laughs> but i wasn't going to take you all into my messy study <laughs> But this is where the Wi-Fi wants to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've always loved color. Love, love, love yeah. color. And it was hard because I, you know, I grew up in the rural U.S. I was the only black girl in my school, town, family, <laughs> you know, and uh, I didn't necessarily want to, you know, be looked at. But um, I love color and I love dressing in color. And I've always been that way, even if I, you know, stand out. Um, so, yeah, I definitely had that kind of innate. African love of color and of joyfulness and of like, oh, everything looks good on my skin. Let's go with it. That's it. <laughs> right. Melanin. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, and I and I want to, you know, yeah, keep keep me smiling, keep that sun. It's so important. So <coughs> yeah. Um, okay. Someone has asked about my African book club. 
Thank you for asking. So one of the things I do, because there are so many wonderful stories coming out of Africa right now, so much incredible literature, is that uh, in 2015, I started a community African book club, and it has now moved over to the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. It's the last Sunday of every month. We're only reading the latest stuff that was published in the 21st century, and we have tried to um, kind of pivot from the original, all that literature that came out of Chebe Shoinka and stuff in the first run. And now we're really focusing on uh, women's literature, literature written by queer folks, experimental stuff, stuff that goes into Afrofuturism. Uh, it's open to everybody. We're still online and you can just <clears throat> go on to our website. Um, we have a, a, a bookshop on bookshop.com. We've read 60 books at this point. You can see what we're reading and then you can stop in. Uh, and this Sunday we have Mukoma Wa Ngugi, who's the son of Ngugi Wa Tiongo coming. It's his birthday and he's going to spend his birthday talking about his latest book with us. Yes, because <laughs> this is how our brothers and sisters show up for us. Uh, so you are all welcome uh, to that. <coughs> okay, someone is asking you about Af the African proverbs that you use in the book and wanting to know if there are something that are still appreciated by the youth today, or is that seen as something that, you know, our grandparents said? <laughs> well, I mean, I can't speak for Africa's youth, but <laughs> I can I can certainly say, again, because it is a very diverse continent, and, but, but I, can, I can certainly say that I think there is quite a lot of appreciation, even just among my own family. I have nieces mm. and nephews that really value, you know, these profound African proverbs, which is just wisdom. It is called, it's just wisdom. And yeah. one of actually my favorite proverbs in this book, and it's difficult to choose, is you must act as if it's impossible to fail. Mm. So even though it's mm. in proverb, this is actually like really, really important. Yes. <laughs> like lessons that we all need to have now. It's so current. And that's what I always find that, you know, even though they are set in this sort of ancient time, mm. their relevance is just, it's incredible. We, we are all looking for some kind of inspiration. I think that particular proverb <laughs> kept me going. I mean, you know, you know the journey of writing a memoir, you know just how much yes. work is involved in that, in, and even just trying to create change in the world. There are some mornings when it's just hard. Mm -hmm. It's just really, it's really tough work or you enter into a community and you see just the amount of suffering that it's just, you can't even comprehend how much, so much pain can exist in our world, right? And kind of this dichotomy of there are people with so much and then there's people with just very, very little and you can feel quite demoralized by it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. by constantly reminding myself, I've got to act if it's impossible to fail, it just keeps me going. And I find that a lot of these proverbs as well that there's just such incredible and profound wisdom in them that we could all use in our world right now. However mm. long the night, dawn always breaks is one of the proverbs. Mm. We are all living through a very, very dark era where, I mean, the amount of suicide that's happening, yes. you know, if, just like yesterday, another, another young woman like jumped to her death. It mm. feels, it feels heavy, it feels overwhelming yeah. and perhaps, this wisdom from Africa could just help us remember that this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, dawn will break however long the night. Yes, yes. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I really relate to that. Um, and I love the idea of Proverbs of, yeah, they're just, just these chunks of wisdom, our ancestors mm. speaking back to like keep us companion, you know. Yeah, uh, um, yeah and just follow that. Um, so key. I can really, yeah, really relate to that. I had um, my first memoirs based around, you know, really becoming so depressed and having a breakdown, in, you know, in college and then having to kind of put myself back together. Um, and, and I was actually kind of relieved that I crashed and burned so young because then I knew I could survive anything later on. You know, it's yeah. just like, okay, I've hit rock bottom and now I know like life is not always good. There are always going to be challenges and all you have control over is your response to it. You know? Yeah. It's and, actually faith. If you don't mind me asking this, because again, I think we're touching, you touched on a very, very important subject. Cause I know a lot of young people are struggling right now and you have lived 
through some of the most difficult moments. What would be like maybe even just like one advice of how people who are feeling depressed right now can figure out a way to get up again tomorrow and, and keep going and mm. not give up? Yeah, it's uh, it's a tough one because you hear that people make that decision really, really quickly. And and yeah. for me, I know my I know my emotions feel real, but they're not reality. And so it's like yeah. so now when I feel that depression coming on, I'm like, let me just do something <laughs> that I love, you know, yeah. read, talk to someone, take a walk and just know that like it feels completely real right now. But this this is this is not it. And you also, of course, depression makes you want to be alone and not reach out. And people always say, oh, why didn't you tell me you were struggling? And you're like, because I was struggling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know? I know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's almost kind of like leaving little notes for yourself. Like, we'll call this one person and just mm -hmm. say something, you know, and if I can just laugh, then I realize, oh, okay. Once I start to laugh, then anything, I can put everything kind of in context. So I think it's just remembering that even though you feel the emotions, they are not the whole reality. And as you say, tomorrow morning, even though it may seem like a cliche, it will be a bit different tomorrow. It will shift a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I see really is here. <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing. No, it's really, really powerful. And also even just this idea of trying to give back. You know, yes. I think they've done so much research on this that, you know, sometimes when you're so focused on your own challenges, one way of trying to figure out a way to like pull yourself out is just by doing something kind to some other person. Something for someone else. It's so true. You know? Yeah. And for me also like looking at history, because I was just like, I have so many more options than an African woman, you know, centuries ago would have had. So how dare I, you know, I am my yeah. ancestor's wildest dream, right? So like gratitude, you know, right? Gratitude. Yeah. Yeah. Just gratitude, expressing gratitude for the smallest things, you know, like even in, in some friend, my friends laugh at me and I go, well, I'm grateful today because I had a whole shower and they think, well, what's so special about that? And I say, well, because it was a time when I used to bathe with cold water in a bucket. Yes. So the fact that I had a hot shower today, that's something to be grateful for. And optimistic about yes oh, that's so true those so tiny tiny just joys which i get a lot through meditation just focusing on the joy of breath and of all the senses around you and stuff like that and just being present and not getting caught in this loop this mind loop of what i should have done or when my life will be better but just in the now and the gratitude around really small things like the sun on your face or yeah all of that can yeah really help Wow. Thank you both. Oh my gosh, <laughs> this is amazing. I am, um, I'm not going to physically do it, but I want you to know that um, metaphorically, I'm uh, patting myself on the back for <laughs> sharing. I think one of the best pairings we've had, Faith, I'm so glad um, I thought about you. Uh, the last time I saw you was, well, we're all in a time warp now. Because right, I know. <laughs> But it was a few years ago at the uh, writer, the travel writers conference. Oh, okay, yeah. Introduced each other uh, to each other and uh, started talking because I loved your book, and um, I, I just happened to think of you. I I just thought uh, Faith seems like a natural with Elizabeth, and I, this was great. It's such a ray of sunshine in the middle of the day, and. I wanted to just comment, Elizabeth, that one of the two of the things I loved in love about your memoir is the interchanging as Faith brought up going from different locations from your community in Africa to your challenges in England and other locations. And I thought that just, I just found myself drawn into both stories, mm. both journeys uh, immediately, but it also really makes sense when I think about, I just hosted uh, Michael Tubbs uh, last week. And he mentioned with his community and family in Sacramento, California, mm -hmm. that uh, that he, or, I'm sorry, Stockton, actually, that no matter where he lives, he takes his community with him mm -hmm. yeah. and how his ancestors and his community kind of go with them. And I thought, wow, that's so amazing. But it's like you're reinforcing that concept, like your life, your work, your whatever may take you to different continents, let alone different cities. Mm. 
but it's kind of like your community can and your family can sustain you and constantly inspire you. And that's what kind of the two things I was getting from your story that meant so much to me and I could relate to. Um, Elizabeth, um, you're a bright light, one of the best presenters I've ever had the honor to host. And I've hosted probably hundreds of events for book <laughs> and faith. Man, I'm calling on you again. You were uh -oh. you a great connection. Great connection. I love it. Um, we have a lot of Elizabeth's books at Book Passage, San Francisco, Corte Madera. You nice. can go in the store safely. You can uh, call in and a bookseller will be happy to help you with your order. Um, or you can order it online as well as Faith's books, uh, like Meeting Faith. Um, also go to the links in the YouTube channel for more about what Faith is doing with the, the book club, but also your sleep stories, uh, a partnership with Idris Alba, I believe. So. Yeah, if you're an Idris fan. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> I'm there. Uh, thank you so much for doing this, um, both of you. Uh, please come back again. Um, in the meantime, stay safe and happy and keep spreading the inspiration. Thank you so much, Paula. And I hope to see you in San Francisco soon. I'll come and sign some copies. Oh, that would be awesome. That would be great. <laughs> All right. Faith. Oh, thank you so much. Oh. Amazing. This is a virtual hug for you. <laughs> Thank you, sis, for everything, for the love, and also for being such an inspiration to me as well. Mm -hmm. So I hope we get to meet each other in person someday. I do. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. That would be so lovely. Congratulations uh, on, on everything. And thank you for all that you do for all Thanks. of us. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. Wonderful.